All right, so I was working on a huge long video. In fact, I've been working on it for a while, and I was pretty determined to get it out before I go on vacation in July. But man, I just had to admit that it was not going to happen. And even if I did get it edited, I still need time to do the music, and check for mistakes, and re-record bits that might not be accurate. And I was completely miserable trying to rush through the editing. It's not unusual for the video making process to start to feel tedious, but that usually doesn't happen until the final stretch. I'm not even halfway through. Don't worry, the video isn't cancelled or anything like that. I'm just slowing the process down because, frankly, I, I can't handle any more stress right now. To be honest, I've been kind of in a state of despair for the past few months, and it just gets worse by the hour. Literally, Roe was overturned while I was editing this video. I'm inserting this audio in after the fact. We've regressed back literally 50 years, not just with abortion rights, but with gay rights. Not only is gay marriage up on the chopping block, but we're back in the 1960s where people believe that gays roam the streets looking for children to prey upon. You see, Ralph was a homosexual, a person who demands an intimate relationship with members of their own sex. Gruber is a common word thrown at LGBT people and drag queens. Gruber! 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 And Florida passed a law literally not letting educators tell children that gay people exist. Texas passed a law banning drag queens from talking to children before they did anything about the gun laws that got a bunch of children killed like a month ago. Lauren Boebert has famously tweeted that people shouldn't be allowed to come out as LGBTQ until they're 21. Lauren Boebert married her husband in June of 2007 when she was 20. Even putting gay characters into children's media is seen as grossly dangerous because it can corrupt their little fragile minds. This is all a culmination of a line of thinking I've been seeing lately that being gay is inherently sexual. And since it's sexual, it's inappropriate for children. And I agree that children shouldn't be seeing sexually explicit content, you know, obviously. But a gay couple existing isn't sexually explicit. Two boys holding hands isn't sexually explicit. A teacher pointing out that sometimes kids might have two mommies isn't sexually explicit. Sure, it's a sign of sexuality, but so is a kid seeing their mom and dad kiss. Or two characters in a Disney movie kissing and getting married. That's heterosexuality right there. So why is it that Disney movies can end with their straight couple swapping spit? And that's all pure and wholesome. But if a gay couple exists in a Disney movie at all, it's too inappropriate to show small children. Well, I can tell you the answer. It's because the Disney movies are straight. And straight is considered the norm. When people look at a child, they automatically assume that they're going to grow up to be straight. That the little girl will be a boy crazy adolescent and the little boy obsessed with dating girls. And people start putting these expectations on the children straight out of the womb. If a baby boy and a baby girl are sitting next to each other, all the adults in the general vicinity start cooing like, Oh, look at them. Look at the little ladies, man. What a little flirt she is. You're gonna have your hands full when she's in high school. Here are a series of baby onesies that either say something something sexual or imply the baby has a sexuality. And hell, these expectations are even put on the child before they're bored. Here is a gender reveal cake that calls the possible baby boy a stud muffin, which is defined as a man perceived as sexually attractive. A baby. Why is this scene as cute and normal? But two men holding hands in a children's show is considered obscene. The thing is, well, I do think it is kind of questionable to force all of this onto a baby. Like, you know, babies are just sort of amorphous blobs that go about life only concerned about eating and pooping. Little kids do start to show bits of attraction at an early age. They will have pretend weddings in the schoolyard and have crushes on other kids in their class. And these are seen as not only sweet and wholesome, but also completely normal rites of passage. So people get that kids will start developing feelings for the opposite sex before they're old enough to understand what those feelings 
feelings mean, but just cannot wrap their minds around the fact that kids might feel the same way about children of the same gender. Because homosexuality is seen as sexual in a way that heterosexuality is not, it's seen as disgusting and perverse to suggest that a child might have those feelings, and that if they do, it's because they must have been corrupted and groomed either by an adult who wants to take advantage of them, or by the perverse images of loving couples getting married in the tit children's television series Arthur. This morning, cartoon controversy after Alabama Public Television refused to air the premiere episode of the hit children's series Arthur, which depicted a same-sex wedding of one of its most popular characters. And this isn't even getting into trans kids. I'm not trans myself, but I can't help but notice this weird contradiction going on where anti-trans people are saying that the only real trans people would realize that they were a different gender as a child. It almost always involved boys who began feeling it between the ages of two and four and were strong and persistent in their assertions to everyone around them that they were really girls. But then also saying that kids can't know they're trans? That's impossible. You're just grooming and corrupting and lying to them. Tragically, we've made it far too easy for kids to take this path long before they're ready psychologically or emotionally to make such a life-altering decision. And then making it so having a trans child can, means that you're committing child abuse and you can get your child taken away. Using the just straight up lie that little kids are getting surgery as a justification. But then acting like cis kids getting the same exact treatment trans kids get is totally fine and normal. It's fucking gross. And while I cannot and will not speak for the lived experiences of trans people, I can say from my own experience that children can get a grasp of their identities at extremely young ages. I didn't know gay people existed when I was a little kid. I distinctly remember my mom explaining the concept of homosexuality to me when I was like nine. And in case it hasn't been painfully apparent on this channel, I am a... Uh, not straight. I'm not really like a labels person, but I guess I'm a lesbian, right? Like, I can't really think of a single dude I've ever had a real and legitimate crush on. And I say real and legitimate because I used to force myself to have crushes on boys in my class when I was a kid, because that's what all the other girls were doing. And I was kind of confused why I wasn't doing that. But I knew that boys and girls got together. And I would probably get married and get a husband someday. So I should try and be just as boy crazy as the rest of the girls in my class. But I just couldn't muster the enthusiasm. I didn't date in high school. I used the excuse that all the guys in my school were gross, which, I mean, they were. But that didn't keep the other kids from going up to me or my younger sister and asking it horrified hushed toads if I was a lesbian. It was mortifying, mostly because I had the faint fear that they might be right. I remember when I finally came to grips with my identity in my early 20s, my first thought was, ah shit, those assholes in high school were right. And for the record, I had a similar reaction to Dan Howell coming out. Like, I'm embarrassed enough that those shitwads in my high school were able to sniff me out like a bloodhound. I can't even imagine it at the scale he was facing. So the feeling that I was different was always there. It was there when I was a teenager, a tweed, even when I was a little kindergartner that didn't know gay people existed. I remember following around little girls on the playground because I found them pretty and I wanted to play with them. I remember being five and really, really liking Daphne from Scooby-Doo. Like, really, really liking her in a way I couldn't quite explain. I remember telling my mom that Daphne had purple eyes, and her telling me that no one has purple eyes. And I mean, at the time, I think that was true. I think she had black eyes. But they're purple now. <laughs> Daphne really got me obsessed with redheads. I think that was part of the reason I got into Hawk Girl. She was a redhead with a mace and huge ass wigs, and every single part of that really, really appealed to child grace. I remember I had some kind of, like, a trading card with her backstory on it. I don't remember any of it. Uh, I think she was like an alien or something. I don't know. Uh, really, I just remember watching Justice League and being entranced whatever this redhead 
of big wings was on screen, and around the same time, I got really, really into Power Rangers Dino Thunder, which is, I feel like, a more obscure Power Rangers show, but it was my first one, and I loved it a lot. Or, well, I should say I loved Kira. Kira was the Yellow Ranger, she was a pterodactyl, she had screaming powers, it was really cool. I didn't care about any other character, it was all about Kira. I spent a year of my life, at least, staying up at night thinking about Kira and how badly I wanted to go and be the pink Dino Ranger. Like, okay, there wasn't a pink one in the show, and I knew the yellow and the pink rangers were the girls, and, and then I would imagine scenarios where Kira and I would go on adventures together. I remember being mildly grief-stricken when I came to the difficult conclusion that the show wasn't real, and Kira wasn't real, and I would never actually get to meet her. Like, I was actually kind of devastated. Fast forward a few years, I actually spent a good deal of my tween years watching soap operas. I guess because my mom had been watching them every day since before I was born, so they were always on, and I got hooked on some of the plot lines, I don't know. They aren't very good, but I still do defend them to an extent because the episodes would literally air five days a week with no seasonal hiatus. I can't blame the writers for coming up with batshit storylines when they have to write like 250 episodes a year. Like, what do you even expect? So, there was this character named Sky Lockhart, which by the way is the prettiest name ever. Maybe that was what attracted me to her initially because she was a Super, super minor character. She was in a relationship with Victor Newman's villainous son, Adam, and I think the first time she was on the show, she didn't really, like, do anything. I mean, she was, like, good at gambling. That was a character trait that she had. And then she had this phone call with Adam where she hung up and then looked off screen and said, what are you doing here? And then a chopped up decomposing corpse was found in the Newman barn with Skye's ring on it. Adam finds her diary and learns that she was abused by a doctor and then using that to blackmail the doctor to steal a baby. Look, it's a soap opera. There's always a baby getting stolen. <laughs> she shows up as a dream ghost every now and again. Also pretty standard fare. But then a little while later, she's revealed to be alive. She faked her death because her gambling got her in trouble. Once again, pretty standard fare. <laughs> no word on where she got the dead body. I don't think the writers thought of that. Anyways, so there's some relationship drama. She ends up in an abusive relationship with Adam and then fakes her death again, framing Adam and going to Hawaii. Sharon finds her there and tries to take a picture of her to prove she's alive, but Sky grabs the camera and falls into the volcano and dies. For real this time. Probably. <laughs> now, I really, really liked Sky. I liked her sort of take-no-shit attitude and how she made one of the villains in the show nervous, and I thought she was gorgeous. I remember that I had a bunch of photos of the actress saved onto the computer, and I edited them together into a collage in MS Paint, and sometimes I would just, like, look at it. <laughs> there is no heterosexual reason for that. Also, if the actress looks familiar, uh, do you remember that birth control Yaz that had all those really bad side effects? Carissa had massive blood clots in both lungs. Her coma lasted almost two weeks. Yeah, this is the lady from the corrective ads. The FDA wants us to correct a few points in those ads. That's unfortunate. <laughs> Sometime around this, Victoria started airing. I never liked it. I think I was slightly too old when it came out. I just found it cringy and not very funny, and I disliked most of the characters, except two. I liked Dondre, I thought he was chill, and I liked Jade. And I know Jade is kind of a terrible person. Most of her actions are pretty inexcusable and she treats Kat horribly. Granted, I do think she was in the right in the prom episode, but yeah, otherwise, she's kind of a monster. <laughs> Look, at the time, I was just kind of like, oh, you know, she's the only one who seems to realize how stupid everything is. And I also think that this show is stupid, so I relate to her. That's what it is, I relate to her. Uh-huh. 
I think maybe she's like a more exaggerated version of Sky for me. That I liked her because she was really aggressive, and then add that to how pretty she is, and well, yeah. Actually, ever since Quentin did those uh, eight hour victorious videos, I've seen that a lot of bi women and lesbians had the same experience I did with Jade, and I think that's nice. She connects us all together. <laughs> Jade West gay icon. I've also seen a lot of art of people shipping Jade and Tori since Quentin's videos, and it does my heart good. Like, sometimes I see art of Daphne and Velma kissing or just being in love, and it makes my inner child just scream with joy. Going into adulthood a little bit, uh, I remember being 18 and seeing the Rocky Horror Picture Show for the first time. You know, I was gonna make a Rocky Horror video, like, ages ago, like, that was gonna be my first video. But then I decided not to because it's kind of a controversial movie and, like, I get why. I, 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 I want to stay in my lane. But I do legitimately feel like this movie did kind of kickstart my whole journey of self-discovery a little bit. The moment I always point to is this short little bit during the Touch a Touch a Touch Me song, where Magenta and Columbia were in bed together watching a live feed of Janet losing her virginity, and they're like laughing and tickling each other and jumping all over each other. And I remember watching this as a teenager and just thinking to myself, I want that. I want what they have. And then Magenta and her brother turn against the others and shoot Columbia to death, and it felt like my heart shattered into a million pieces. Like the sheer betrayal I felt that Magenta could kill Columbia like that. When they were in playing in bed together. Devastating. <laughs> now obviously there was that moment when I was like 19 where I watched Sin City for the first time. And fell deeply in love with Brittany Murphy. I talked about that in the Godforsaken Cherry Falls video. But that was more about the actress than the character. And I mostly try to keep this to fictional characters. Because I think it's awkward to bring up real people. Like I've had a lot of real life crushes too. And god forbid they ever find this video. You know what I mean? But it is worth mentioning that that was a significant moment. In me coming to grips with my identity. Even if I was hugely in denial at that point. That same same year too, Until Dawn came out, and I developed some heavy feelings for Jess. Jess was probably one of the least beloved characters in this game, which is understandable. She is kind of terrible, and the writing for her is questionable and also not really good. <laughs> Man, I really gotta make that Until Dawn video. I have so many opinions on Jess. But I thought she was really adorable and spunky, and I genuinely thought that the actress did a really good job with her after she got all beat up. She's just a sad, exhausted little puppy dog. I love her so much, and I would get super, super defensive if someone didn't like her, which happened a lot, because, once again, she kind of sucks. And... It was like, I knew rationally that she was kind of a stereotypical mean girl and I would probably hate her in real life, but my god, I still loved the fuck out of her. I drew her, and I, I thought of her constantly, for like a year. And now I'm going through the same exact thing with Lady Dimitrescu. She is also a terrible person, I am just learning so much about myself today. But she is powerful, and tall, and... Okay, look, I already went through this all in the Resident Evil 8 video, you don't need to hear this again. But the difference between Jess and Lady Demetress is also something like six years. Like, I was still extremely in denial and repressed when Until Dawn came out, but by the time Resident Evil 8 was released, I was a lot more open, right? I just, I still just didn't really feel comfortable sharing that side of me because I hadn't before. I was so used to hiding it away that it was pretty much my default. But then last year, sitting in a room with my cousins and loudly, unabashedly screaming my love for this 10 foot tall woman, proudly calling her my wife, it felt kinda good. It was the most free I had ever been in my entire life. And then bringing it up on my YouTube and my Twitter over and over again like it was the most normal thing in the world. I don't know, it just 
really meant a lot to me. And the actress who plays Lady D, Maggie Robertson, was here for the LGBTQ community, like, right off the bat. Here in House Dimitrescu, we support gay rights. And also my niece saw Lady D once and she became like her favorite character and I bought her an autograph and the actress wrote a whole novel on it and it was the sweetest thing ever. Like this whole thing has just made me very happy. I was supposed to meet Robertson in July. It was part of that aforementioned vacation I'm going on and I really just kind of wanted to fake her for all of that. The event that she was attending ended up getting cancelled due to COVID, which is probably the right call even if I am deeply disappointed. You know, it does something to you when you grow up with a repressed sexuality. All the girls I knew had Twilight and boy band phases that allowed them to explore their feelings and be loud and open about what they liked. I never had that, and any inkling I had that was anything remotely similar was shoved down as deep as I could muster. I never really acknowledged to myself at that age that what I was feeling was romantic, you know what I mean? My mother is pretty accepting, all considering, even back then, but I grew up in a time when that's so gay was such a common insult that there were PSAs telling people to stop saying it. We'll say that something's gay when you mean it's bad. It's insulting. What if every time something was bad, everybody said, oh, that's so girl wearing a skirt as a top. In my hometown, there was this huge scandal when a diner put the Ellen show on and the locals were disgusted that this lesbian was being played while they were trying to eat. So there was no way I could have ever felt comfortable being myself back then. I never got to experience my adolescence, the awkward dances, and shaky first dates of middle school. Phantoms where you could scream in public about how much you love a character or an actor. I think that's why I've dug my claws so deep into this 10 foot tall vampire woman. She is my twilight phase. She is the vampire I get to fangirl over and be cringy about online. And yes, it is super cringy. I, I guarantee in a few years, I'm gonna look back on this and I'm going to cringe super, super hard. But that's fine. You should look back on the media you used to explore your identity and cringe a little bit at how loud and proud and annoying you were. Instead of this sad resignation I have looking back at all the crushes I didn't realize I had because of how deeply I buried myself. And look, I know that a lot of people claiming gay people are targeting children don't really believe it. I mean, look at the people chanting groomer outside of this bar. Groomer! Groomer! They're gonna come here and groom a bunch of children! They're gonna groom a bunch of children in here! They don't sound scared or upset. They're gleeful. They're reveling in the opportunity to mock and discriminate against a group of people that they see as lesser and are using any excuse that allows them to do it. And most, if not all, of the people coming out of the woodwork to harass LGBTQ people aren't becoming homophobic all of a sudden, even if it does kind of feel like it sometimes. They just feel safe expressing their bigoted views and are pushing back against society, finally making the small smallest sliver of progress. If these people really did care about the well-being of children, there is, uh, a completely different group that they should be worrying about. Hell, Lauren Boebert's husband, the one she married when she was apparently too young to know her sexuality, is literally a sex offender. In fact, Lauren Boebert was actually present when he did the offending, when she was 16 years old. So, yeah, that's a thing. But the fact that this front of protecting the children has gotten them as far as it has proves that there are people who really do believe that children are being groomed into being gay, trans, etc. But that takes so much away from the children themselves. Kids are emotionally immature, and their brain isn't fully developed, sure. 
but that doesn't mean that they don't have complex inner lives that might not fit neatly into the little boxes that their parents want them to stay in. Kids who are bi, trans, ace, they're there and they feel things and experience themselves and the world around them just as strongly as the straight cis kids do. Just because you don't see it or refuse to see it doesn't mean it's not true. Hiding the fact that gay people exist from children or making it a hostile world for gay people to exist isn't going to keep the children from turning gay. It's going to teach them that their feelings aren't normal and they're going to bury themselves just like I did. And then a whole new generation of kids are also going to lose their adolescence.